Hello and welcome to OUM's Meet the Dean with Dean Crystal Boone, MD. I'm Dr. Nicolette McGuire, Associate Dean for Student Engagement at OUM, and I'm joining you from Ontario, Canada. For today's session, I'm going to ask Dean Boone a series of questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box and we may answer it during the session. So a special welcome to Annalisa, Anatoly, Anne, Deborah, Diana, to Fung, to Greg, Luvika, and Gozi. Hi to Nordia and Ravi, Shanda. Hi, Shanda and Thomas, and hi to those of you joining us via recording as well. So welcome, Dean Boone. We're glad you're here. Hello. So that our prospective students can get to know you a bit better, can you start by telling us about your journey to becoming a medical doctor? Yeah, so I actually went to a historically Black uh, college and university, Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. That's where I earned my Bachelor's of Science in Biology with a minor in Chemistry. I then would go on and work um, at Vanderbilt in nephrology research, and that's when I decided that research was not for me, and I would need to make another route, which is when I decided that, yes, I need to go with my first passion, which was always medicine. So I went to medical school. I uh, went to a medical school in the Caribbean called the American University of Antigua. Once I graduated there, I then entered into residence in which I did a short residency stint. And then I said, ah, medicine is different for me. So I then went into preventative medicine, which then led me down the road to informatics, where I ended up uh, moving to a very small town in Missouri where I practiced and eventually went directly into informatics was the, uh, and I was the chief medical information officer there. And then I had my sons and then I said, oh, I definitely want to stay home. I need to find opportunities more to stay at home. And I really didn't know what I was going to do, but I had always worked for OUM and the opportunity came up for me to become dean. So I said, okay, perfect. So I don't currently practice, but I could return to practice. And if I did, it would probably be in public health more than back into the clinic. Thanks, Dean Boone. So can you describe a week in the life of a dean at OUM? So I think probably <laughs> a good example of my life would probably be the last week or so. Uh, the last week or so, we had a lot of things collide. So um, as dean, I work with many different groups. So whether it's the bursar's office, the registrar, uh, the USMLE team, we all work together to make sure there's different parts of North America that run very smoothly. So within the last week, we actually had two major processes collide with each other. One was getting our um, some of our students to their final graduation requirement, which is our OSCE. So for our OSCE, it is currently hosted in Manhattan, Kansas. And it, we, uh, I guess the easiest way to explain it is imagine a day in the clinic. So the students walk in, they have 10 patients that they have to see. So they have patient encounters as well as patient notes. Uh, they walk through a series of normal questioning as well as going back to their computer and putting in a note the same way that you would do a regular EMR chart. We analyze them not only on their patient encounter, so how well they did that history and physical, but also how well did they document what they did. And then at the end of the day, we sit down with the students and we walk them through what are the pros and cons of their day, right? So we do, uh, even though students pass, and this is something that we stress it, that even though you've passed, there's still things that you could have done better, right? So we understand that the OSCE is that final graduation requirement for our students. So we want to make sure that as a, an academic team that we're giving them their final feedback from this standpoint, because the next time that someone gives them feedback, it's probably not going to be friendly because they're now an intern and they're at the bottom of the barrel in 
the physician world, right? So it's not going to be as nice and as pleasant as our conversation. So we hope to kind of correct some of those behaviors that you may not notice that you're doing. So that's one thing that happened last week was that OSCE. And then we are also in the midst of our residency season. So our residency season, um, what we do at in the university side is we have to gather uh, what we call the medical student performance evaluation. If you Google this, this is known as the MSP or the Dean's letter is what it used to be called. So uh, this consists of several areas from the registrar. Uh, the university has a whole section called the medical student um, or the medical school information section, as well as we have three sections that I personally write, and I try to make sure that they're unique and they're personal. So whenever a residency program reads this document, that they get to know you outside of your academics, right? So if you're a mother and you really want to highlight that you're a mother, we put it in there. If there's something that you do in your community that you really wanna highlight, and there really isn't a lot of great places to highlight that, we put it in there. And then we also put it in there of how it's helped shape you as a student at OUM and how we believe that it helps shape you as a future physician, right? So the MSP does take us a while to put together and those were all due last week. So we had to write up those and get those back to the students for their final review and then get them uploaded into the residency application for the students. Woof. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so many of you who are here today are prospective students, and that's something that you can look forward to in the next, you know, four and a half to five years doing your OSCE, which is the objective structured clinical exam that happens at the very end, and getting uh, Dean Boone to write you a glowing uh, review in your MSPE to support you in your residency matches. So um, I want to start back at the beginning, kind of where these students, these prospective students may be starting um, if they, you know, happen to be part of our January cohort. Um, so I want to ask you about, is there anything that you're working on right now that will be a benefit to students who are going to be starting in January of 2024? Yeah, as far as the North American students, I think something that they can start to look forward to is us introducing those USMLE principles earlier. We will have the USMLE program currently is uh, ran at the end. So typically you go through all of your organ systems. Then at the end, we you complete the USMLE prep program. We're now going to be branching pieces of that program and then feeding it into your organ systems. So you're actually preparing along the way, um, hoping that by the time you get to the end of your organ systems, that your preparation time is greatly decreased. Right now, we do estimate it at about six months. Uh, some students are able to finish it sooner than that. Some students take a little longer than that. But we do think that with this preparation, that students will be able to finish it in less than six months. Like majority of students will be able to finish it in less than six months. And our goal is really to get you to finish it in three months. Great. So in addition to this integration of USMLE prep in the first um, couple of years, what, what can students expect in their first two years of medical school at OUM? Hard work. No. Um, <laughs> Dr. Boone, she doesn't, she doesn't sugarcoat things. I'm no. so like excited to have her on today. She's very no nonsense. She'll just give it, she'll give uh, you the honest answer. So please let us know a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, first and foremost, I think one of the first things that students should be very mindful of is the a time commitment, right? Like you will learn a lot of information. And I recognize that sometimes you come from a background in which you may already hold a doctorate level degree. Um, some of you may have even completed masters. I would caution you against comparing those degrees against this program because it is quite unique in the amount of information that you will receive daily. Um, you will find yourself, you know, at times feeling like, wow, this is simple. 
And there's other times where you can study 12, 14 hours and walk away feeling like you've done nothing for that day. And that's all normal. That's the thing that I want you to understand. That's all normal. So that's what your first two years looks like. It looks like about a 60 hour study week. Um, and you have, well, let me go to the beginning, right? So you take your general principles introductory course. And one thing that, let me say this, because I'm, I'm saying a lot of little pieces in between because there's a lot of things hit in my mind. One of the things that I hear from prospective students is, hey, I already have a full-time job. I plan on coming in. I want to do my full-time job and I'm going to get into your general principles. I'm going to see how it works out and then I'm going to decrease my hours. I would say that that's not the right direction to go in. I would tell you instead to take a step back and say, what's the least amount of hours I could work, right? If the least amount of hours that you currently can work based off of all of your needs is 20 hours, then start there. Start at the 20 and then start to work your way through general principles. Once you get to a certain point where you're like, oh, I really could work like 25 hours, add the five hours. It doesn't hurt to add it later, right? But taking it away is a little bit more complicated. When you're in a position, especially those who are in the medical profession, you know that those hours are already accounted for. They're already counting for you to be that provider on staff. So it's very hard for them to find your replacement. So you coming and saying, oh, I can't work uh, next week. I need to reduce my hours by 15 hours. They're going to say, there's no way. I can probably get you covered for five, but there's no way I can give you 15 with a week notice, right? So by the time you get through general principles, you're now in the middle of general principles, potentially struggling. So you might be passing, but have you really learned the information to retain it? Remember that in North America, that there are licenses and exams that are required of you. Whether you're in Canada and you have to take your NAC and the MCCQE, or you're in the U.S. and you have to take the U.S. MLEs, these exams are required of you before you graduate OUM. So we are requiring you to recall this information immediately. So you're receiving this information throughout two years, and then we're asking you to sit down and start to study on it, right? And now you have to go sit for that first license and exam. So it's very important that you're not missing information. Also, something that I want to say about medicine is that it is cumulative. So what I teach you today is something that you will be able to apply in almost every organ system that you go in. So in general principles, you might learn about blood vessels and just like the hemodynamics and not really understand how it works, but then you get into cardiovascular. They really start to talk about things like the Frank Starlin law and different things like that. And maybe what I'm saying right now doesn't make a lot of sense, but essentially this is the same law that drives edema. So whenever we talk about pulmonary edema, this is what went wrong in the blood vessels is a disruption in this law. So you technically learned it in general principles, but now you're in cardiovascular and it's now coming another way. Well, guess what? You get to urinary and that same law pops up again because now this is the same law that's gonna help drive the urinary system. And whenever we have failure of this system, so we have kidney failure, for example, you now are gonna start to see these same principles being tested. So there are some principles in medicine that if you don't capture them the first time, they'll continue to haunt you. So instead of coming into cardiovascular and really being able to understand those principles very easily, you're now struggling because you missed it in general principles, right? And now you struggle, you survive again guess what? You turn around in urinary, it comes up again. And I would hate for you to believe that that's the last time it's coming up because it'll come up again and again and again. And I could use that same example for literally every organ system in the body that we have blood vessels. Those hemodynamic principles come up over and over and over. So missing it in a class like general principles would be detrimental to you, right? 
So again, think about your work schedules. How can I adjust those work schedules, work at that minimal level, and then say, I can build on it. If you can add those five hours, 10 hours, feel free to do so. But if you find that, no, I really need to keep it at this 20 because this is what I need to survive. And technically, I wish I had more hours. Keep it at that 20, right? So all that, and then just piggybacking off of what Dr. McGuire asked me, you're going from general principles into the organ systems. Once you're done with the organ systems, you're now going to turn into the clinical transition units, which for North America really starts to look like preparing you for those licensing exams. And again, we hope that we're able to transition you out of that area in about three months so you can enter into your clinical rotations. So just in terms of what you were talking about, about medicine being cumulative and needing to learn things in general principles and then apply them in cardiovascular and then in urinary and then in pulmonary, um, can you can end talking about, you know, that you need to start with the lowest amount of hours you can work if you happen to be someone who is working prior to starting uh, school. Can you talk a little bit about like what a typical week is like? Like what does a cardiovascular student do from Friday to Friday in a given week? Yeah. So then I am also going to make a comment about this too, with your work schedule too. So um, at the top of the week, this is where you'll receive all of your lecture material. This is actually one of the differences between us and a traditional medical school, right? So a traditional medical school, you go to class on Monday, you'll receive some lecture material on Monday. You go to class on Tuesday, you receive some lecture material on Tuesday, et cetera. However, at OUM, all your lecture material is delivered to you by that Sunday evening. So at the top of the week, you now have all of your lecture material. So I really advise students that if you do have to work, it is not wise to start your week off with your work hours, which a lot of students say, oh, I'm going to work Monday, Tuesday. That's not the best time in your schedule because the lecture material is brand new and you do need to give your time give yourself time to listen to the lecture material, process it, as well as get through the required readings. And again, don't assume if last week you were able to get through lecture material in, you know, X hours, that it's going to be that way this week. Because I will warn you, in medicine, there's good weeks and there's some really, really bad weeks. So you'll have one week where it seems like, wow, I was able to listen through all this and I get it. And then you're going to have some weeks where you're like, oh my God, I have no idea. And now you're on your fifth time listening to it. And it's not because of the lecture. It's just because for you, that material is just a little bit more challenging, right? So you have that lecture material at the top of the week. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you have live lectures. In North America, I do say that those live lectures are absolutely a requirement. Change your work schedule and be at those lectures. We have it. So it's always going to be 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Or we have another session that corresponds to 8 p.m. Brisbane time. So this does correspond for most of the US and Canada for early morning hours. So you're looking at about, depending on where you're at in the US or Canada, between like 3 and 6 a.m., depending on the time of the year as well, because they also have daylight savings. So it always stays at 8 p.m. their time. So even when we go through daylight savings, it does not change. It will stay at 8 p.m. their time. So again, that could be as early as like 3 a.m. for some um, and as late as about 6 p.m. for some. I mean, 6 a.m. for some. So if you're a morning person and you're like, you know what, I really need to work. So Tuesday, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to go to this class at 5 a.m. And then I'm going to start my work day at 9 a.m. That's fine. You can sign up for those Australian sessions as well. We do allow for you. So it's not like you're locked into a North American session. We do allow for you to switch those sessions if you believe that that works best for you. And then, so you go through that um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, live lectures. So what happens, sorry, not live lectures, live sessions, interactive sessions. 
what happens in those, like in the organ systems, you have workshops. Workshops are really going to help you understand a lot of the material that you just received in those lectures. You have a case discussion. A case discussion day is going to now present that lecture material in a case format, and it's going to have specific questions that you should know about it. And then the last session of the week is PBL or problem-based learning, in which you will receive a case, but this is a little different in that you actually decide what you learned from that case. And this is kind of, unless you've done PBL, it's a little hard to explain, but if you're reading a case and the very first thing that comes to your mind is oh, I have no idea what that word even means. Like, what does it mean to have tachypnea? What does that word mean? Then that's the first learning objective is defining that word, right? So that's what we do in PBL is help you identify knowing what you don't know, which is one of the hardest things to do in medicine is acknowledge the fact that you're not gonna ever be perfect and you will always have those moments where you don't know what you don't know, right? So how do I recognize that? How do I know that I've now reached my scope, right? This is, I'm at the top of where I can practice and I now must seek out additional help. That's what we hope PBL helps you to start to recognize how to do that, right? Whether that's either A, going and researching it using different research uh, methods. So up to date, for example, or even using a peer. So I'm calling up that specialist and I'm saying that, hey, I have this, these are the test results, what are your thoughts? And then they may be saying, hey, I need to see them in office. So being able to recognize when, yes, I'm, if I were to continue seeing this patient, I would be practicing out of my scope. That's a very, very critical, not only for patient safety, but even for you to understand your own limitations in medicine as well. And these topics like in professionalism and in medical professions are taught really early on at OUM. So you kind of mentioned some of the differences between OUM and a typical program. So I wanted to point that out to yep, like having, getting your lecture materials all up front over the weekend and then having these live sessions where you're able to interact with the course professor, but also actually able to have conversations um, and connect and learn from the other students in your cohort, which is incredibly important because of what you're saying about, you know, some, some weeks it's going to be, oh, it's just a total, you know, I know these because I'm not going to need as much time. And other weeks it's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. And so having those people around, it's going to be different <laughs> in a different week for each person. Um, a lot of students have a concern that because they're doing those preclinicals um, in a Zoom environment rather than in live classrooms, that they won't have opportunities to connect with or meet other students. So how would you, how would you address that? What would you say to students that have some concerns about that? I would say I totally get it because <laughs> um, I would say that one of the first things that I thought as well is um, how do I even work with my colleagues, right? How do I interact with my colleagues and get to know them and get to know their personality type if every time I'm interacting with them is be it a phone, a text messaging sort of thing, or I'm seeing them in a Zoom environment. And believe it or not, you really can get to know people really, really well via Zoom. I don't know if it's because we've had this shift in our thought process since COVID and just being able to interact, but I think it existed in OUM long before that, that I honestly knew the people that I was working with. Like you just get to know, I, I would say, if you're really, really concerned about that, the best people to ask are the current students, right? And I know that there are students that are available to you, but ask them, ask them how they met, you know, they're sitting in Texas and they met a person from New York and now that person is their best friend, right? Um, or ask them how the person that they've never even ever met in person because they live in Samoa is one of their closest friends, right? Because those relationships exist as well. So I will tell you, I understand it, but somehow it works. And I don't know if it's because we've shifted our mind more, but um, I think the fact that you're interacting with people, especially in the PBL, the problem-based learning, you don't have 
the demands of, oh, here goes these set of questions. Everybody comes in with the same degree of vulnerability. So the the uh, one of the goals with problem-based learning is we all know the same things in this room. So if one person doesn't know tachypnea, we all don't know it. So if there is somebody who knows it, tell, right? Go ahead, let everybody know. And you just start to learn, okay, I can be vulnerable with this group of people and I can tell them, I don't get it. I don't understand. And then they're, they respect that because it is a respectful environment. And I think that's one of the keys to operating in a Zoom environment or any environment is understanding that respect always needs to rule it. And I can say wholeheartedly that that is something that is practiced without a doubt at OUM. Um, if you want to talk with a student and learn a bit more about their experience, I encourage you to get in touch with your admissions counselor who can recommend a student ambassador for you to speak with. We also had a live session with our student ambassadors a couple months ago, and your um, admissions counselor can also give you access to that recording um, as well. So since we're being real honest, <laughs> do you yeah. know? Can you give us like a realistic view or some realistic advice about the balance that students have or need to have between work and study and life when they're in medical school? Oh my goodness. This is, this is like a loaded question. So first I would say that this is different for everyone, right? There are some people who um, you don't need to eat dinner with your family every evening. But there's some who you absolutely have to like for your own mental health. This is the one thing that you have to do with your family every day. If it is, do it. You know, I, I, um, for example, when I'm interviewing students, they'll say, "Oh, I, I'm a runner. I'm, I, I like to run." Don't lose that. If you're somebody who every single day you need to get up and you need to do that run, do it. Even if you stayed up till really late trying to get that lecture, do it because it's going to help you with your mental health, right? So balancing everything, this is really, really tricky. First and foremost, understand your motivation. Like, why are you doing this? If you're somebody who you're like, oh, I'm doing this because I want to be a doctor. I want the title of a doctor. I want the prestige of a doctor. First of all, I don't even know if you understand that doesn't really exist. <laughs> like in real life, it does not exist. There's, it, the headache is not worth what you think it is at the end of the day. It does. It's not. So I would tell you, really check your motivation. If there are, um, if there's things that you've seen in medicine and you say, I feel like I can make an impact here then keep that going, right? I always tell students, write down that motivation because there's going to be days, like I told you, those days where you've studied for 12 hours and you feel like you've done any nothing, right? That's when you look at those motivations and you say, okay, that works. Okay, I know why I'm here. I know what I'm doing here. I can do this. I can wake up tomorrow morning and I can try to do this another way. I can pick up the phone and I can call, you know, so-and-so and maybe she was able to get this and we can walk through it, right? So um, that's one, understand your motivations. Two, understand your support system and understand how committed your support system is to you getting through this program. If your spouse or significant other is kind of like, mm, yeah, I don't mind you do it, you're probably not going to make it through the program. You really need your significant other to be fully committed to this because they will take probably the greatest hit when it comes to sacrifice. Um, when it comes to those, you know, oh, can you spend time and sit down and watch a movie with me? You're going to be like, absolutely not. I have four hours of lectures. I'm not watching Game of Thrones again, right? So like you want to make sure that your you're you're able to have these really really tough conversations up front with your significant other so both of you are not blindsided at the end of it and this is a real thing this is not just in medical school this is in the medical profession you can go and you can look at the divorce rates right 
it's quite high. And it's because these conversations are not had. It's very important that you understand what is important for you and what's important for your significant other. If you guys have to draw up a schedule where you say, okay, this and this day, we're absolutely doing something. And you know, at the end of the week, I promise them that I'm going to be available at 6 a.m. because we're doing dinner, then you do it. Try your best to keep those commitments to your loved ones. And I say the same thing for your children as well. If your children, children are very big on presence. So one of the hardest things that you're going to have difficulty with being is present right? You're, you can show up to that game, but like you've snuck your AirPod in your ear <laughs> and you're listening to that lecture again, right? And like, before you know it, you're cheering for the other team. Your kid is wondering why. Is <laughs> like, so you want to be mindful that presence, but somehow you can still be there for them, right? So understand how can I be there for my family. And again, I don't have the right answer for this because you have to look at yourself and you have to say, what's important to me? If your religion is important to you, you make sure that you're still carving out that time to do those activities, right? Don't say, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that because of medical school. You don't want to get into that pattern because it stays with the profession. And to be quite honest, the profession does not get easier on time. If you're putting in a 60, 70 hour work week in medical school, guess what? Residency, it's an 80 hour work week. When you then back it off and you say, okay, now I'm a practicing physician, maybe you can get yourself down to that nice, comfortable 50 hour work week, right? It's very rare that you meet a younger, newer physician that's able to pull off less than 40 hours, right? So understand that that time commitment stays. So learning how to balance actually starts in medical school. If you're struggling with finding out what's important for you in medical school, it does not get better with graduation. It does not get better with residency, right? So understand the sacrifices that you're willing to make today, you'll continue to make them as you move with your career. So if something's valuable for you today coming in, keep it that way. Do whatever you need to do. If your children, your significant other is valuable to you, make sure that you keep them at the top of your priority. You carve out time for them weekly and you do those activities. And then obviously self-care, whatever makes you happy. If you're somebody who you absolutely, like I said, love to run, make sure you're doing it. If you're somebody who you love massages, go get your massage. Make sure you keep those things going while you're in medical school. Again, it does not change. The profession is a demanding profession. So you will continue. If you're able to give up your kids now, trust me, no one's going to say, oh, yeah, go to your kid's game now. No, it's going to be even easier later on to give up your kid's game. So speaking of tough conversations and things being very demanding, we have a lot of questions from North American students about requirements in terms of licensing exams and specifically the USMLE steps. So um, all the OUM students take and pass USMLE step one before they move to their clinical rotations, which is true of the vast majority of medical schools um, that serve the United States. So can you tell our prospective students a little bit about that requirement? So um, do all U.S.-based students need to take the USMLE steps before moving on to their clinical rotations? Yes. Sorry, you must use USMLE step one. Yes, absolutely. Yes, they will need to. So we do have three regions that we serve, and the goal of the three regions is to make sure that you're able to be licensed in those regions once you graduate. And it is based off of where you live at the time that you come into the program. So if you live in the United States, you will stay on that North American program, for example, till you graduate. Uh, and the... Um, the goal is to make sure that every student who graduates from OUM is able to be ECFMG certified. So there are four things that ECFMG, which for those who are unaware what ECFMG is, ECFMG is the liaison between a foreign medical school and 
the U.S. So, and it's not only the U.S. So I should say that it's the liaison between, it's the liaison organization between foreign medical schools and uh, certain jurisdictions because ECFMG works in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, et cetera. But they do something different in each of those countries based off of what the countries require from them. So in the United States, ECFMG does have something known as ECFMG certification. And what certification guarantees the AAMC, which is the American Medical Council, what it guarantees is that I am granting this individual an MD under the guise that they meet the same requirements that a U.S. medical grad would have meant. So that means that they have passed USMLE step one and they have passed and completed USMLE step two. They have earned their medical diploma from an accredited institution and they have passed an oral um, English test. So a lot of Americans say, what? I've been lived in America my whole life. English is my only language. <laughs> Why do I have to take an oral English test? So because you are coming from a foreign medical school, this is just a requirement that ECFMG has. I think it makes it probably easier on them um, and it probably keeps them out of a ton of lawsuits. So they're not saying, oh, you're coming from X country, go test your English, right? Because that would just end up bad for them. So they just say, you come from a foreign medical institution, immediately you have to take an English language test. So the English language test um, from everything that I've heard from you know, students who English is their primary language, they say it's a piece of cake. It's not anything that you even have to worry about. So those are the four requirements. And then you're now eligible for ECFMG certification. ECFMG certification validates your degree or validates. So that MD without ECFMG just is, it just sits out there. It's just like a random piece of paper. When you get ECFMG certification, it now validates it. It now says that this MD is credible and it is equivalent to a student who would have attended school in the United States. So you're now eligible for residency programs, as well as for those who say, well, I plan on using my degree in other spaces, such as I plan on going into academia, I would love to teach. Well, one of the organizations that most academic institutions use is another organization known as ECE. What ECE does is ECE will then send a link to ECFMG and say, hey, can you tell me if this degree is valid? ECFMG would say, yes, they're ECFMG certified. This is truly a MD that you are hiring. So- okay, Oh, sorry, we do have a question that's specific to that. Um, yeah. And there's the student or the prospective student is asking, as a USA citizen and resident currently has different career paths and practicing conventional medicine, will I be able to obtain an MD diploma from OUM without having to pass USMLE step one and step two? And the answer to that is no, because again, in the US for our degree to be considered valid, we do have to have you go through ECFMG certification upon graduation. So in order for you to go through that, again, you have to meet those four criteria, which the first two are USMLE step one and USMLE step two. So you must have passed both of those exams. And Anne wants to know, is the standard pathway available to U.S. students, the standard pathway being the pathway that typically our students from Australia, New Zealand, and Samoa take? So again, we do practice in different regions or the school covers different regions. So the standard pathway, I think there's a misconception that the standard pathway students don't have license and exams. They do have license and exams as well. So for example, in Samoa, it's uh, they go and they actually are entitled to their government. So they do immediately graduate and literally the very next Monday. So they walk across the stage on Saturday and on Monday, they're sitting in someone's hospital given their time. Right. So you would if you said, oh, I want to do something like that then that would be up to the Samoan government, right? Which right now that is only open to Samoan citizens. So that isn't something that we would be able to grant you. Second, in Australia, you would have to go through all of the licensing requirements in Australia as well, as well as any type of visa requirements that they would have. So again, this would make our degree 
not seem very valid if we were to graduate you in a country who we knew you couldn't immediately practice in. So it's very important for you to understand that as a U.S. citizen, you do immediately, once you're done, go through ECFMG certification, and you are now eligible to practice in the U.S. And I know there's Canadian students here. So Canadian students, you will do um, the NAC as well as the MCCQE, and then that will allow for you to now be eligible for licensure within Canada. So you're now eligible for their residency the same way that you would be eligible for residency in the U.S. with the U.S. MLEs. We do have a question specific to Canada that Sylvia has asked as well. Um, hi, Sylvia, who's from Saskatchewan, and they want to know, due to the shortage of medical staff in rural, they're wondering if the years of the program can be reduced, especially those for those who are already working in the field, like nurses and paramedics. Okay, so one thing that I would say again is I would really caution that there is a difference between those degrees, right? So we do not have any fast-tracked um, ways to get a medical degree. A matter of fact, if you read on ECFMG, ECFMG actually has a mandate that a medical school cannot be completed before four years. So any foreign medical institution cannot grant a degree before four years. So therefore, even if we could do it, it would make you have an invalid degree for your practice in Canada, right? So we don't do it because we want to make sure that you are able to practice um, anywhere that you're willing, you're you're able to go. So whether that be Canada or the U.S. And all this to say, these requirements are in place to ensure that everyone who graduates from OUM is eligible to practice in the jurisdiction where they um, live. And, and want to work. So those are not OUM based requirements. Those are licensure based um, requirements. So we talked a little bit about USMLE prep because it's something that students get worried about, nervous about, and for good reason. And you spoke a little bit about how students who will be starting in January will benefit from having an integrated USMLE prep program. Did you want to also um, provide any information about the NBME, which is also one of the um, requirements and support students in their USMLE step journey. Yeah, so when you go through the USMLE prep program, one of the ways that we're able to predict your um, ability to actually perform on your USMLEs is using the NBME. So the NBME stands for the National Board of Medical Examiners. They have a series of exams that are available to institutions in which we tap into those exams to kind of gauge your performance. Uh, it gives us a really good idea of if you're really able to walk into the exam. If you're not able to walk into the exam, then we tell students to, to just take a step back and to take some more time studying. So the National Board of Medical Examiners are the same exact individuals who are responsible for the USMLE. Okay, so... Students have been accepted, they've completed their general principles, they've completed their organ systems, they've done their USMLE prepped, they've passed their NBME, they've passed their step one. Let's talk a little bit about clinical rotations that's next. So what clinical rotations do OUM students complete and where can they take these? Yeah, so OUM students currently have 72 weeks of clinical rotations. 56 of them are dedicated core rotations. 16 of them are electives. So for the core rotations, we do find you core rotations. This is made available to you uh, based off of whatever our current affiliation agreements are at the time that you rotate. So you will have a combination of family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, psychiatry, general surgery, obstetrics, and of course, I'm forgetting, emergency medicine. <laughs> and they range anywhere from about eight to 10 weeks. So for example, internal medicine and surgery are both uh, 10 weeks, whereas emergency medicine is a four-week rotation. 
Once you complete those 56 weeks, you will then sit down and you will study for step two. The reason why we ask for you to sit down and study for step two after you're done is because step two is just a test on those core rotations, meaning there is a section dedicated for internal medicine, there is a section dedicated for family medicine, pediatrics, et cetera. So students sit down and they take those um, exams at that time. Once you pass USMLE step two, so it's, I said exams because you also have another NBME that you do have to pass. So you have an NBME and then you take your USMLE step two. Once you pass those exams, you're now eligible for larger hospital systems. So larger hospital systems uh, tend to be tied to these very prominent medical schools. So if you're in, for example, um, uh, speaking with a prospective student who is from Ohio, and in Ohio, they have things like Case Western, right? So Case Western has several hospital systems that are available to students where they could go to these hospitals. Once you complete step two, you would be eligible to complete electives there. So if you said, okay, I'm really interested in pediatrics, you could go to Case Western, you could do pediatrics there. We also encourage at that time that you're doing what we call interview rotations. So more than just getting exposure at these big hospitals, you're using those electives to put yourself out there for potential residency programs. So let's say you plan on applying to this a specific residency program, we would tell you to set up a rotation with them. And this would serve as kind of like a preliminary interview. Trust me, if you performed well, you could contact that program director and say, hey, I applied to you and I can almost guarantee you would get an interview at that program. And it likely would be a, a potential match for you. So that's uh, actually 12 weeks. So you have three opportunities to do that, three four-week opportunities to do that. And then you would have a four-week rotation in Samoa. So in North America, our students tend to make Samoa very flexible. And the reason why is because they do go into these hospital situations where because there's uh, competitive medical schools, they do have to do them at certain times of the year, meaning that the program may say, hey, we can take outside students, but it's only between August and, you know, November. So that forces a student to then go into the rotation during that time. And we know that because we are affiliated with the hospital in Samoa, we do have a little bit more flexibility with Samoa. So I will tell you that you could either start with Samoa, you could put it in the middle of those, or you could put it at the end. We have some questions about rotation sites. So Darlene wants to know about doing rotations, if they can be done in US, Australia, and New Zealand. Dan wants to know about doing rotations uh, in Alaska. He's a physician assistant there. Hi, Dan. And um, Gozi wants to know about um, whether US students can do any rotations within Canada. Yeah, so all very good questions. So first, I would tell you that licensing authorities prefer for you to have done rotations and where you will be licensed. And this is because you do understand the patient population. It's very dangerous for them to accept physicians that have never practiced within the patient population. Because as you can suspect, um, you know, our American culture would be very different than another culture, right? So understanding certain cultures, perspectives, that's very important. That's why whenever you're applying to residency, if you're already from a rural community, a rural program will select you because they say, hey, they get it. This is, it. they understand everything about this, right? So again, I highly encourage you, if you are somebody who's very interested in certain types of communities, so if you're from a rural community, you're very interested in that community, engage with members, physicians within that community, because that will be your best, um, your, your best bet in being able to return to that area. Now, as far as can you complete them outside? So the only one that we recommend for North American students, again, because of licensure, 
uh, is Samoa. We actually don't recommend that you do any rotations outside of the United States, except for Samoa, just because there are several states and even residency programs that will require that you've had X amount of weeks of exposure to uh, medicine in America. And it doesn't matter where, but medicine in America. And it, so is if the state you're interested in says, oh, we only need you to have 50 weeks, then obviously we can call, um, you know, across the pond to Australia and see if they can take you. Right. But if there's another one that says that we need for you to have done, you know, 70 weeks, then we're going to tell you, hey, you write, you know, the fact that you're already a nurse practitioner here, that counts, but then they really need for it to be majority of your clinical education. So that's where you're going to have to do those 68 weeks here and just hope that they forgive those additional two. Last location-based question, because we have some applicants from New York, California, Texas, Florida, we want to know whether OUM students would face any restrictions doing rotations or gaining residency in those areas. So those are two different types of questions. <laughs> so um, first and foremost, I always encourage students to go and look up their own specific state laws and requirements. A matter of fact, it's very hard for us to say if you are 100% restricted from residency. Now we can tell you from the perspective of rotations because this is something that we deal with from day to day. If there are certain states where we don't currently do rotations due to restrictions. So the states that were mentioned are very good examples. New York, California, Florida are states that currently have restrictions on us where we would not be able to complete rotations at this time. However, these states may allow for you to practice medicine depending on certain things. So for example, in the state of California, you could go to, let's say, Pennsylvania, complete a residency in Pennsylvania, become a fully licensed physician within Pennsylvania, and then return back to California. Same is true for like Texas examples. But again, I would tell you to really, really take a look at what those requirements are. And because legislation changes from year to year, and it can change how any foreign medical school operates. But rotations are quite different than residency. Residency has to deal with direct licensure within that state, because as a resident, you are a physician, you do hold a restricted license. So therefore, every state has a variation of what it takes in order for you to hold that medical license. So now I'm going to come all the way back to what we were first <laughs> talking about with you signing off MSPEs and students finishing their OSCE and talk a little bit about students once they get to the point where they start to apply for their residency. So does OUM have any career or services or supports for students who are applying for residencies? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's kind of what I was getting to that's taken up <laughs> so much of my time. So one of the things that we do um, is we actually have something known as the residency series. So all students who will be part of the upcoming match, they then meet over a series. Um, so the first series really is just dedicated to helping them get into the application system, understand what they're looking into the application system. And then the next is just really helping them gather their letters of recommendations and just a whole lot of information on that. We also have personal statement reviews where we read through the personal statements where somebody goes in and they copy edit for us, but then we also um, critique it for the validity and relevancy of what what you're saying? Do we feel like this may be interpreted um, differently by a program director? And lastly, part of that um, residency series is that we have mock interviews with individuals who have actually been part of residency programs, and they've either served as chief residents where they themselves have had to sit down in these interview processes, or they've been program directors and so forth. So we do let you sit down 
we have a mock interview with you in which we give you very transparent feedback. I think once you meet me and you see that it is a very transparent feedback. So if we feel like you didn't do well on a question, we will not sugarcoat it. We will tell you that if you want to really impress somebody, you need to change that answer. You have to think about it from this perspective versus this way, right? And we're very honest with you because we understand with us, it's practice with them, it's real life and it's life-changing. So we wanna make sure that we're being as um, critical as possible. And so you're able to go out there and you're able to perform at the top of your game. And then you're the person that, people want to hear that from not the reason. exactly <laughs> that's what I tell everyone I tell them like you understand that this is coming from a place of love versus out there it's coming from a place of we don't want you to be here right <laughs> um can you tell us about some of the recent residencies that OUM students have been accepted into or OUM graduates I should say have been accepted into Yep. So we have been accepted into family medicine and psychiatry over the last two years. That's the top two ones that everybody is going into family medicine and psychiatry. Um, look for this year's residency because we have students going into other specialties as well this year, but um, I won't mention it just because that is um, something that you're not supposed to speak on before residency season. <laughs> It's my favorite. I want all, I want everyone to do family medicine residencies because we have such a shortage yeah. of positions. And I especially love when I'm doing academic planning with students when they first start and they say they want to practice family medicine in rural locations. And I'm really, yep. <laughs> I'm really family medicine is high. Yeah, I'm there to support all of you, but that has a special place. <laughs> for Absolutely. Me. And I will say on that is that at, when you look at competitiveness, um, family medicine and psych rotations do match um, foreign medical students at a higher rate than any other specialties. So if you're really saying, I want to go into surgery, it's not that you can't go into surgery. It's just that your chances of matching will always be stronger with those two. They've And they've done this for like the last 20 years, right? If you look at their match rate, they just match higher um, for medical grads. I want to ask you a little bit about what advice you would give our prospective students today. But Greg has a question about being a prospective OUM medical student and wanted to know, could I realistically start self-studying preclinical subjects now, listing a few kind of resources that are publicly available? What would you what would you tell Greg and others who are wondering if they could start now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my all-time favorite books ever, ever. Matter of fact, if you listen to any of the lectures that I record, I always go back to it. And I think it's a resource that you could start to pick up now. It's called the Costanza Physiology Book. I think it's easier to read. It's an easier physiology book to read. Um, and physiology is just like the basis of medicine. If you understand physiology, then you understand pathophysiology and um, you understand diseases, right? So it, it's kind of like what I just told you with that hemodynamic, and well, what I told you guys earlier with the hemodynamic instability, that's something that you, that's a physiology principle that then goes out of whack and now you have all these pathophysiologies that follow. So I will tell you that if you wanted to stand, start somewhere, it's the Costanza. Um, I believe it's her and her husband, but Linda is the first one. This is like my all-time favorite book. I've used it literally since medical school, still use it to this day. I think they're maybe on like their eighth, ninth edition, something like that. They but have absolutely videos too. Yep, that they do. The they sense. have videos. <laughs> So if you wanted to start somewhere, I could say, because the very first chapter in that book is cellular physiology, start there. If you feel like, oh my gosh, this is going over my head, I will tell you another resource that you can start to kind of get used to. Don't go spending money on this. Uh-uh. Let me, <laughs> hey guys, there's a lot of money to be made in medicine because they know students struggle and they're always finding a way to make it easier, right? So what I will tell you to do, is if you're struggling, like you're reading this and she's talking about the alpha beta receptors and you're like, I don't get it. 
go to YouTube. And then all you have to do to make sure that you're getting it at the level, right? And this is wherever you're at in the world, whether you're in Australia, Samoa, you're making sure that you get it at the level is always type USMLE before it. Because at that, when you type USMLE, so if you say USMLE alpha receptors, it's always going to be lectures that are at a medical school level. If all you do is type in alpha receptors, you're going to start to get things that are undergrad level, nursing, it's going to throw you off, right? So go type USMLE alpha receptors. A really good resource that you can throw in after that word is osmosis, right? So say osmosis alpha receptors, right? If nothing comes up, because that's the name of the company, if nothing comes up, don't worry about it. Use anybody else who comes up because the guys who come up that are competing with osmosis, they're going to be very good as well. And there's so many of them. There's so many of them and they're really, really good resources. So start with cellular physiology. If you're reading cellular physiology and you're like, whoa, this is going over my head. I really don't think I can handle it. Maybe you just need to be in a structured environment to get it a little bit more, but I would tell you, you could start there. And if you finish that chapter before you started at OUM, you'll probably find a lot of what you're learning in general principles, really simple to learn. Thanks. Do you have any other parting advice you'd like to give our prospective students um, as they consider their applications? Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I would just tell you really, really take time to sit back and think about your schedule as well as your resources. You know, a lot of people, when you say resources, people automatically jump to the fact of finances. But when I'm saying resources, I'm also thinking about those support systems, right? So really making sure that all those things are sound before you ever start. So if you're somebody who you're struggling, like you have a really, really sick, ailing family member, and you feel like you're going to want to be there for them, then maybe this isn't the right time for you to start, right? I'm not saying that you can't, but just think about what those resources are, how you can handle those resources while going through medical school. So if something goes wrong with one of those resources, what's the bounce back plan? If you don't have a bounce back plan, think about it, right? Think about what does it mean? So I tap into this, I tap into that, or I go here and understand what that looks like. Thank you. Yeah. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us live today, or if you join us via recording, I want to thank you for joining us too. I know that you will all join me in thanking Dean Boone for her time today. As you can see from our conversation, it's pretty in pretty short supply, um, but we were really happy that we we're able to have her here today. If you have remaining questions that you didn't get answered today, I encourage you to reach out to myself or Dean Boone or to your um, uh, admissions counselor. They are a wealth of information. They know the exact person who can answer your question, any question you have at any time. They know who to go to. So I encourage you to use that resource. So thanks everyone so much and look forward to seeing you all in the next webinar and in an OUM classroom soon. Bye for now. See you guys.